Scamming people is wrong. But sometimes people who scam other people get really creative and it is objectively interesting at the very least to see what unique and innovative ways they come up with to scam other people. I would obviously be happier if they would use their creative mind to just come up with an ethical way to make money, but you know, it's entertaining to watch at the very least. It's like a heist movie, you know? I don't wanna do it. I don't wanna do it but I wanna watch it. So today we're going to be looking at some of the most creative slash interesting scams, starting with a manager at a Pennsylvania Wendy's invented a fake employee and pocketed wages of $20,000, police said. She manually clocked the ghost employee in and out for 128 shifts, police said. Also, welcome back to the second channel. This is my second channel. It's where I like to get a little bit goofier and wackier. So just go ahead and crack open a sparkling water and enjoy. This is creative. I admire their creativity. I am honestly surprised that I've never heard of this happening before. This actually seems kind of obvious. It's almost so obvious it makes me wonder why did they stop there with one fake employee? If they did this with five fake employees, that would have been a hundred grand they made. I guess a chance that Wendy's maybe would have caught on earlier if they had that many employees. They'd be like, why does it say every shift there were like 20 people working? I don't think that many people could even fit back there. So let's see here, $20,000 for 128 shifts. Shifts. Let's do some math on that. So that would be 156 shifts. Divide that by eight hours per shift. And that's $19 an hour. Come to think of it, that's probably how Wendy's found out that this was going on. They were like, wait, why are we paying someone $19 an hour? We don't do that. Yeah, 13 to $16 per year. <laughs> Shouldn't that say per hour? No wonder she had to invent a fake employee, dude. She makes $13 a year. I like how they say she invented a fake employee. It kind of makes it sound like the employee was some kind of robot that was actually roaming around the premises. She brought in like an old refurbished Chuck E. Cheese animatronic and everyone was like, what the fuck is that? She's like, oh, this is this is Garrett. He's, he's new here. <laughs> you probably haven't met him yet. Everyone say hi to Garrett. Garrett's making more than everyone there. But the employee, it turns out, was not a robot. It was a ghost. Okay, so here's an article about this whole situation. Former Wendy's manager, Linda Johnson, who invented a ghost employee named William Bright, clocked a fake employee in and out for shifts so she could pocket the wages. Johnson, who worked in Pennsylvania, has now been charged with theft by deception. That's gotta be like the most accurate name for a crime I've ever heard. That's exactly what's going on. Sometimes the names of crimes are a little bit out there. Like, grand theft auto. What's so grand about stealing a car? But theft by deception, that's pretty cut and dry. She lied and she stole. She ate hot chip and lied. After a criminal case was bought against Johnson, she then went missing and her whereabouts were unknown as police released an appeal to the public for any information regarding her whereabouts. Missing, huh? What if the article after this was like, on an unrelated note, Wendy's has found a new manager to fill her position and she actually looks exactly like Linda Johnson, but she's wearing a mustache. Her name is Binda Bonson. Authorities are hard at work still looking for Linda. Johnson's crime was posted to social media as people gave their opinion of her illegal methods. One person commented, commending the former manager. I'm not gonna lie, this is smart as hell. You can't even be mad at her. 128 shifts without anyone noticing. This new employee is insane. LMAO. Yeah, I mean, at that point, if it took them that long to notice that there was a fake employee, it honestly sounds like she deserves the money in a sense because all of the work of that employee was getting done. Like, <laughs> Wendy's would have been fine with it, paying an extra person, if there really was an extra person, meaning that there was an extra amount of work getting done. One would suppose. So I don't know. It sounds like Linda wanted to be putting in twice as much work and she just needed a method, albeit an illegal one, to do that. Okay, I would say that was a decent scam. Honestly, I don't even know if I would describe it as a scam because usually I feel like scams are targeted towards a specific person. It's almost like organization scamming a person. This was person scamming organization. I guess I would describe it more as a theft by deception. That would be a good term for it. And this next one might be a similar situation. It's called false change of address moved UPS headquarters to Chicago apartment. United Parcel Services headquarters may be in Atlanta, Georgia, but for almost three months, hundreds, possibly thousands of pieces of its corporate mail were delivered to a small, unassuming garden apartment in Chicago's Rogers Park neighborhood. Sure, a lot of people are wondering, this is very unusual. 
unusual. Uh, unusual and raises a lot of questions, Robin Erica. <laughs> it does raise a lot of questions. First, I didn't know that UPS stood for, what is it, Uni United Parcel Service? United Parcel Services. Why start off the video that way? You know, we all know it as UPS. It just seems crazy to intro the video with like the full version of the acronym that most people probably don't know. Like if I told you I was gonna go drop off a package at the United Parcel Service, I think you would assume I was like traveling back in time to the 1800s or something. I'm gonna go tie my parcel to a pigeon's leg and send it off. Anyway, small gripe. The other surprising thing, of course, about this is that somebody changed UPS's headquarters address to their own apartment. You know, I'll have to wait and watch the rest of the video to try to figure this out, but to me, this doesn't even seem like someone was trying to steal or scam. It almost seems like something you wouldn't think you could do, and so it, it kind of sounds like they were just doing it just to see if they could. It began with a simple unauthorized change of address form made out by a Chicago man. Unauthorized? Hmm, that's weird. I would have thought it would have been authorized, actually. I would have thought UPS would be totally fine with this, but <laughs> I guess they've just changed. I guess they're not the United Parcel Service I once knew back in the Civil War era. Apartment 2 in Rogers Park. A federal affidavit states it became UPS's new corporate headquarter address in October after the man who lives inside simply filled out a change of address form at a post office. Wait, is that him? Is he not in jail? This seems like a very illegal thing to do. I like that they're like, this is really crazy, definitely illegal. Uh, anyway, let's go hang out with him. The allegations are that UPS's mail was coming here because you switched the corporate headquarter address to your apartment. Yeah, those are the allegations, correct. Interesting. Not a bad defense, honestly. Sir, you are alleged to have done this. How do you plead? Correct. I'm sorry? I plead correct, yes. That is the accusation. Am I free to go now? Can I go back to my apartment? Shit, yeah, I guess so. I am really thrown for a loop by this situation. They literally just went and knocked on his door to talk to him. You know, usually someone has like a lawyer talking for them or they say like, we reached out for comment, but they haven't said anything. This guy's just like, yeah, come over. We can talk about it. Have authorities talked to you? Have they interviewed you? Uh, yeah. When did they search your apartment? It was probably in January or February, one or the other. January or February, and this was uploaded in April. So it seems like this like this whole situation really isn't getting to this guy. He hasn't been arrested. Months went by, and he's, he's like an open book about he's it. He's like, yeah, they came by, took all my stuff, but uh, I'm still here. Actually, I'm starting to think that there's more going on here than meets the eye. I'm starting to think that this guy actually is the CEO of UPS and he just doesn't want anybody to know. I'm starting to think he was actually right to change the address to his address. He is UPS. The question then is, why wasn't it first flagged by the post office? A spokesperson says he can't comment. Yeah, see, that's usually the response you get. They can't comment. He can't comment. But this dude was like, I can comment. Fuck it, I am, I am UPS now. What do you want? Well, I think the answer to her question though is pretty obvious. Why didn't the United Postal Service do anything and flag it? Because they hate UPS, all right? They're competitors, they're rivals. They were probably happy to see some guy cashing UPS's checks. They might've been in cahoots with this guy. All right, we got an article about this situation. As federal crimes go, this one seems to have been ridiculously easy to pull off. If it even was pulled off at all, which I, I actually still don't know. Deshaun Henderson Spruce submitted a US Postal Service change of address form on October 26, 2017, according to court documents. He requested changing a corporation's mailing address from an address in Atlanta to the address of his apartment on Chicago's north side. It really is a confusing situation because like if this was going on for months, did UPS not notice that they weren't getting any mail for months? You'd think for a company that's whole thing is mail, they would notice when they don't get any mail for months. And also all of the checks that they're supposed to be getting aren't coming. Is no one looking into that? The US Postal Service corrected the issue and the USPS Postal Inspector is investigating the incident. Speaking of the US Postal Service, uh, here comes the mailman and my dogs are barking. They hate that guy. If I had to take anything away from that one, I would say I am surprised if he fully knew that he could get away with that. Cause that just seems so far fetched. I feel like no one would even try it because you would just assume like, of course that's not gonna work. But he had the gall, he had the gumption, he had the go-getter attitude, he had all the G words. And furthermore, I admire him for that. 
Okay, next one. Man stole $122 million from Facebook and Google by simply sending them random bills, which they pay. The top response is not really theft, to be honest. So, whereas the first one was theft and deception, I gotta say, I think this one just might be deception. Doesn't sound like he was stealing anything. The company was willingly paying him, and it, you know, he was lying, which is wrong. He was doing something unethical, but also, you know, Google and Facebook, you gotta check and make sure that you're not just paying somebody for no reason. This does again seem like one of those things that nobody would ever try because you would assume that somebody is checking to make sure that you actually did something for them when they're paying you. This is like going to someone's house and being like, all right, you can pay me for mowing your lawn now. Meanwhile, their grass is like overgrown. You don't even have a lawnmower. They didn't ask you to mow their lawn. And they're like, sure, how much did I pay you? $122 million? I wonder what the bills were for. I feel like there had to have been some tact in crafting those bills in terms of like what service he was supposedly providing for Facebook and Google. Like he must have been somewhat knowledgeable at least about what goes on inside of Facebook and Google. Cause like I wouldn't even know what to submit a bill for. Like, pay, hey Google, pay me for um the website. I made the website. You can pay me now. Maybe every time there's like a logo redesign or something, he bills them for it. And he's like, I, I designed that actually pay up. $122 million is insane. On one hand, I'm like, why didn't you stop at like $10 million? Like that's more than enough money. You could have quit while you were ahead and gotten off scot-free, dude. But now you are stuck with Scott, unfortunately. But on the other hand, I'm like, it's kind of crazy that Google and Facebook could even afford to lose $121 million before noticing. So in that regard, I'm kind of like, they didn't really need that money, did they? While you're at it, Google and Facebook, go ahead and give me some of that money too, if you don't. A man pleads guilty to stealing $100 million from Google and Facebook by sending them fake invoices. See, there's your problem. You pleaded guilty. You're supposed to just say, those are the allegations. It's sort of the, I know you are, but what am I of the legal system. A Lithuanian man who duped Google and Facebook into transferring over $100 million into accounts he controlled has pleaded guilty to wire fraud. Hmm, wire fraud. So not even deception? No theft or deception? Mr. Rimasakis and his unnamed associates, ooh, that's kind of mysterious, were posing as Quanta Computer, a hardware company based in Taiwan that has done business with Facebook and Google, Reuters reported. Oh, okay, so he was posing as a real company, but he just wasn't really involved in the company. Oh, look at this ad. Facebook birthday, 15 defining moments for the social network. I like that the picture is Mark Zuckerberg. It just makes it seem like this ad thinks that his name is Facebook. Everybody wish Facebook a happy birthday. Look how happy he is here. Rimasakis thought he could hide behind a computer screen halfway across the world while he conducted his fraudulent scheme. I mean, he was like kind of right though. He did get away with it for a long, long time. I think that if he had just cut his losses earlier, he could have hid behind a computer screen and conducted his fraudulent scheme. But a Class. He was, he is probably in prison now. And what he did was wrong. We can all admit lying, scheming, stealing is wrong, but thank you for the giggles. Is there truth behind the Bristol Zoo parking attendant myth? For 25 years, a man worked as an attendant at Bristol Zoo's car park, collecting one pound for every car park. One day he didn't show up for work and the zoo asked Bristol City Council who they thought the man was employed by where he was. But the council didn't employ anyone for their role as the car park belonged to the zoo. Instead, the enterprising individual running the car park had made enough money to retire abroad. Wow. Okay. This is kind of similar to the Wendy's ghost employee situation, but the ghost employee was real. Granted, he wasn't actually a ghost. He was just an employee. He was self-employed. He's an entrepreneur. It's a well-known tale. I wouldn't say so. I've never heard it. Circulating by word of mouth and in more recent years via social media. However, it now seems there could be truth to the urban myth. Okay, here's a Reddit post about it too. It says, for 25 years, the parking fees were managed by a very pleasant attendant. The fees for cars were 140, for buses, $7. Then one day, after 25 years of never missing a day of work, he just didn't show up. 25 years? Just give him the job at that point, honestly. Like, he works there. Especially because, like, when he didn't show up for work, they were like, uh, we need somebody. Like, they were depending on this guy. I almost wonder if this was one of those situations where, like, they did kind of have an agreement, but they just wanted it to be kind of under the table, so they were like, look, we're not gonna put you on the payroll, but keep doing what you're doing. Park those cars, baby. Meanwhile, sitting in his village, 
villa somewhere on the coast of Spain or France or Italy is a man who'd apparently had a ticket machine installed completely on his own, then had simply begun to show up every day, commencing to collect and keep the parking fees estimated about $560 per day for 25 years. Assuming seven days a week, this amounts to just over $7 million? And no one even knows his name. $7 million? That's insane, dude. I was not expecting that much, but I guess if he retired abroad, like he must have been rich. How do you come up with these cockamamie schemes, dude? I need a cockamamie scheme. Also, sorry if you can hear the very loud lawn mowing equipment outside of my window. I chose a very inopportune time to film this video, man. I'll be honest. But there is a Snopes article about this. Let's see if this might be true. What does Snopes say? False. Ah, fuck. The article's like, he didn't really make $7 million. He actually made $100 million. Well, if this isn't true, dude, I want to try this. If I can make $560 in a day just parking cars, if YouTube ever stops working out, man, you know where I'll be. I'll be at the Bristol Zoo parking cars. All right, guys. Well, thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll uh, see you guys next time. Uh, bye bye